Thank you for the introduction. Everyone sees the slides, hears me, everything okay? Perfect. Okay. So as the title alludes to, we're gonna be talking about the about acute ischemic stroke, specifically about the treatment with mechanical thrombectomy of patients that have distal vessel occlusions. There are no disclosures. And this is the brief outline. We're gonna define what is a distal vessel. We're gonna talk a little bit about current recommendations and agreements, um, research, the research question, methods, results, and in the context of published work, and a little bit of, about the limitations, conclusions, and future directions. So as a brief introduction, we know that acute ischemic stroke, uh, we always hear time is brain, and this is, uh, brain tissue is very delicate. It has four times the need of than every other tissue in the human body. Uh, it requires about 50 to 60 mLs per 100 grams per minute. And whenever that goes below 22, uh, we have ischemic injury. And this results in a penumbra area and then later in infarction. So between the second point and the third point of my slide, you can see that like this uh, brief history of endovascular acute ischemic stroke treatment, there has been major advancements in the management of large vessel occlusions, mainly, of course, with thrombolytic therapy and then with mechanical thrombectomy. This has shifted the entire paradigm of cerebrovascular intervention in, in this type of conditions, and it has deviated the natural course of what is a large vessel occlusion. So it is just natural for us to see now more distally and it is not a strange thing for the neurointerventionalists, given that for all the large vessel occlusion, occlusions that they treat, they have certain percent, about 25, sometimes up to 30% of cases that, are, uh, that have a distal clot that migrates. Sometimes they chase it and they retrieve it. Sometimes they don't. So basically, those are the three main, the three main things that has us talking about distal vessels is that first, the high success of large vessel occlusions. Second, all this attention to the treatment of large vessel occlusions has led to major endovascular technological advancements. And then distal vessel occlusions are very common. So what is considered a distal vessel? Uh, before uh, talking about distal vessels, uh, we need to know that whenever we access with catheter to a target to, uh, to phase the clot and retrieve it, the longer the distance you travel, the greater the tortuosity that you need to go through. And that makes uh, a lot of constraint in delivering the physical forces that the interventionalist needs to do proximally. So whenever we talk about large vessel occlusions, we're usually talking about proximal intracranial vasculature, but this is not always the case. When we talk about distal vessel occlusions, it's usually intermediate and narrow vessels are the small penetrating vessels. The operating uh, parameters are 0 0.75 and two millimeters. Above two millimeters, you have the large vessels like ICA, M1s, M2s, vascular retrievals. And below 0 0.75, you have the, the lenticular triad and PL arteries. So how common is this? We know that about 40% of cases of large vessel occlusion of acute ischemic stroke are due to large vessel occlusions. And around 25 to even 40% of cases are due to a primary distal vessel occlusion. The difference in symptoms is that it's more, it's, it's more heterogeneous. It's more difficult to diagnose. You can see on the right side that since it's more focal tissue, the patients might present with partial symptoms, partial hemiparesis, partial hemivisual field cuts, and this type of symptoms. So, and there's, and this is not a benign condition. There are studies that have reported that dependency and death, it can be up to 60% and mortality up to 20, 25 to 40% as well. So our research question is whether if the methods of anesthesia can predict clinical angiographic and complication profiles in patients with mechanical thrombectomy for the primary distal vessel occlusions. In the context of a lot of incongruency or not incongruency, but there's no agreement as to whether you use one or the other. Nowadays, this is, this is simply uh, a matter of how the patient is doing clinically and if they need mechanical ventilation support. 
and also physician uh, preference. There's some, some say that it might develop worse outcomes, and there's some studies that reporting that, but it's not, it's not certain if this is because of the anesthesia, the effect on blood pressure, or selection bias itself, because so patients that present worse are usually intubated compared to patients that have a lower NIHSS. So we perform a retrospective study of a prospective database here at Mount Sinai, and we included patients that are adult in age, uh, patients that were diagnosed with an acute ischemic stroke due to a primary distal vessel occlusion, so not secondary to a large vessel occlusion. And the patients were treated with mechanical thrombectomy with or without thrombolytic therapy. And they had to have a 90-day follow-up or mortality status available. So the main variables that we focused on were the type of anesthesia. It is very, it, we need to be clear that this, this is the state of anesthesia, not actually the anesthetic itself. So we focused on general anesthesia versus conscious sedation. The reperfusion parameters were with a modified TK score all the way from zero to three. And the functional status was from zero to two, uh, uh, delineating functional independence. In terms of complications, we recorded uh, vessel dissections, um, um, secondary migrations of clots, causing a large vessel occlusion if they existed, and mainly hemorrhagic infarction and parenchymal hematoma, as classified by the ECAS uh, classification system, as you can see here. So from our results, from several potential cases, we identified 70 patients that were according to our inclusion criteria. Median age was 70, 40% were female, and there was a high predominance of comorbidities such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and AFib. Here you can see several other demographic variables that we collected. Mainly hyperlipidemia was significantly higher among general anesthesia uh, group. This, this, this might not be relevant, but this is something that we assess to evaluate for the multivariable analysis. In terms of presentation details, the majority of patients were functionally independent at baseline, and the baseline NIHSS was around 12. Uh, there was 55% of patients with left-sided stroke, anterior circulation was around 70, and we included the occluded segments in this study, and this is very important. A2s and above, M3s and above, and P2s and above. We did not include P1s, we did not include M2s. So this is strictly distal vessel occlusions. In terms of the state of anesthesia, we have that general anesthesia was used in 31% and conscious sedation in the majority of uh, the other patients, 69%. And reperfusion status was very satisfying, around 87%. All these two uh, rates are according to the literature as well. We can see that the trends are over conscious sedation uh, lately, and reperfusion status in distal vessels ranges between 75 to 85%. Uh, last known well, we, we reported the last known well, growing portion to reperfusion, and intravenous TPA was given in 30% of cases. In terms of the procedural variables, we use aspiration thrombectomy in about 80% of patients. 42% uh, needed three passes or more, and successful reperfusion, as quoted previously, was, was uh, obtained in 87% of cases. We can see in the left lower corner an M3 occlusion and a micro aspiration device that was able to, to retrieve this clot and, and obtain an M33. And then the right upper corner, a distal M4 occlusion with a Tiger 13 retriever, also obtained in a TK3. In terms of clinical outcomes, postoperatively, patients had similar NIHSS. At day five, you see across the board a uh, decrease in the NIHSS score. Then follow up at 90 days, uh, we had all of, all of them were recorded. That's why it's just 100%. Uh, functionally independent at 90 days, we obtained 37%. It seems quite low, but it's similar to what has been, uh, what has been experienced with uh, distal vessel occlusions. We can see a report here in, in the Journal of Stroke by Grossberg et al. showing a 30% uh, independence at uh, 90 days and 20% mortality. And for us, mortality was 34% in terms of complications. 
all hemorrhages were 31%, but only 1.4% were symptomatic, and it was a parenchymal hematoma type 2. Symptomatic meaning a in, an increase in the NHSS score of four or more. We assess for early neurological improvement with a multivariable assessment, and the only two variables associated with this was aspiration trombectomy as a method. Uh, it increased by sixfold the, the chance of obtaining early neurological improvement. Early neurological improvement meaning four points or, or more in decreasing the NIHSS. And MTK3, as expected. As of predictors for functional independence, general anesthesia was borderline significant, so I wouldn't say that this is a significant variable, but multiple passes and initial, in initial NIHSS were both predictors for uh, a, a less likelihood of obtaining functional independence on follow-up. For predictors of ICH, interestingly, we saw that hyperlipidemia was the only uh, significant predictor, increased by fourfold the risk of a patient obtaining, uh, of a patient developing an ICH post procedurally. In terms of aspiration thrombectomy, there was no significant difference in general anesthesia as well, and this goes also according to literature. And distribution of functional independence by type of anesthesia, this was one of the main uh, observations that we encountered that type of anesthesia was indeed associated with a, a decreased chance of functional independence for patients that underwent general anesthesia. And this is controlling for NIHSS and, and other significant variables. And th there, there's some hypotheses of this. There's cerebral autoregulation, vasomotor reactivity, and or vascular coupling. All these are factors that are, that are completely changed when you pass the regular homeostasis of a, of a body to the anesthesia and to all the, all the anesthetics that are on board. They change all of this. So there, there, there might be an association between general anesthesia and this function of collateral flow, uh, but we're not certain about that. So as for limitations, this is retrospective. There, there's a limited sample size of 70 patients. And this is not an agent-specific study. This is a state-specific anesthesia effect. And here are the conclusions. Uh, I'm not sure how much, how much time we have on. But basically, neither conscious sedation or general anesthesia confer greater risk for longer procedure for reperfusion outcomes or procedural complications. In terms of aspiration thrombectomy and MTK3, they're both predictors of early neurological improvement. For multiple passes and presenting NIHSS, this significantly reduced the chance of functional independence at discharge. And general anesthesia was associated with a lower likelihood of functional independence at 90 days. And also, interestingly, hyperlipidemia conferred a fourfold increased risk in post procedural ICH. Thank you. Thank you so much, Santiago. So we'll probably have time for a quick question, if there are any. Uh, and while that's happening, I'll ask Sarah to bring up her slides. All right. Thank you, Stefano. And guys, Santiago. just to keep in mind, both of these folks are going to be trying to match this year. So we appreciate any and all phone calls and letters and messages that you can send to your friends around the country. Both excellent yes. folks. <laughs> and we're wishing them the best. Sorry. Uh, I, got the I, I heard your... You're thanks, going thanks to ask for a great question. talk, Santiago. Um, Thank you. Is there any explain? Can you think of any explanation for the hyperlipidemia uh, correlation with postoperative intracerebral hemorrhage? Or, or I'm not sure. I'm there? I'm just I'm just thinking that it might be that these patients have simply uh, uh, more of issues in in small vasculature, and then when you when you open up and reperfuse, this this is this is tissue vascular tissue that it's that that it's pathologic. I don't know the exact sense of it, but I'm thinking that it goes to that end, that they have microvascular disease and, and that just simply uh, leaves the tissue more, more frail. Possibly, yeah. It's, it's not a correlation I've seen before. Yeah. Makes sense. So a quick introduction then for Zara. Zara grew up in Baghdad and received one of the most amazing scholarships I've ever heard of to be able to leave and study in Ireland in medical school. 
uh, and then has made her way after numerous recommendations over to us. She's been with us for about seven months now. And um, Zara, take it away. We're excited to hear about your presentation regarding the Kuno Infarctus. And, and before you get start, started, Zara, I just want to welcome Dr. Osman, who um, has signed in to uh, her mentor for this talk, and will be listening today as well. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Panov, Dr. Morgan Stern. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, my talk today is about the Kuhner infarcts. Um, it's uh, presenting the work that we're doing on the microvascular supply, the basal ganglia, and, and we're presenting on behalf of this amazing team from all over the world under the supervision of Professor James Osman. So it's, uh, it's uh, around 4 a.m. his time right now. So thank you, Prof. Osman, if you have made it to the audience. Um, so let's start with a clinical scenario. This is a 60-year-old gentleman who presents to our ED uh, with a sudden onset hemiparesis, a focal motor deficit, with a CAT scan showing not a massive stroke, but two small lacunar infarcts, as we know them, in the left basal ganglia. So lacunar infarcts represent 20% of all strokes, a major problem, and are known to be caused by small occlusions to these lenticulous right arteries coming from the ACA and MCA. And the, all we know about lacunar infarcts uh, could be mostly traced back to the state of art paper that was uh, forwarded to me by Professor James Osman. This is the great work that was done by Prof. Miller Fisher in 1979, an outstanding neurologist uh, at this time and, and of all times. And this is the uh, a tremendous amount of work that he did on his 11 patients with lacunar infarcts. He followed them uh, clinically and when they died, he took these brain autopsies and sectioned them to very thin slices, up to 4,000 sections. And his main question was where these lacunar infarcts were coming from. How could he trace them back to their source of origin, to the site of occlusion? And this is the amazing diagram that he produced. So as you can see here on the right side of the screen, he plotted these strokes to the occlusion sites, which were mainly coming from these very small perforators, lenticulous rites coming from the MCA. And the sites of occlusions could be traced to millimeters of their sites of origin. And here is a histologic diagram showing us this small lenticulous riot being included by this atheroma and then a very small lumens remaining. Here's the NCA, here's the anticlus riot, and the other vessels have patent lumen. And here's a higher power microscopic view showing us the atheroma that we now know as a lipid laden macrophages representing the process of atherosclerosis that's going on in, in all other parts of the body. So until Prof. Miller Fisher's work, nothing was done until 1998, where Prof. Vasquez Leosa, who couldn't make it to the audience, who is one, he's, he's one of our main collaborators, uh, described the short central artery. And no one knew about this artery. He basically coined the term. Everyone knows about the recurrent artery of Hubner, but he described the short central artery. And now, 40 years later, we're, we're working on a case series from all over the world with pathologies confined to this short central artery. AVMs and aneurysms that were specifically identified and treated by angiography. And um, this is just a, a picture from all the sections to show this is probably a current artery of Hubner, and this is the short central artery, basically a dominant lenticular striate vessel coming from the proximal signal and from the very proximal portion of A1. And this is our work. We're presenting this as a late breaking abstract in the upcoming CNS, so see you all in San Francisco. So what we did is that we, uh, as you can see, this is the ICA, it's not injected, it's sutured away. Then we isolated the ACA, proximal MCA, and distal MCA. And then we injected them with separate colored dyes. And our main question was, how can we trace the origin and the distribution of these lenticular striated vessels? Are they the same or are they different in different individuals? And how different are they? We had a total of 40, uh, 40 brain specimens with a total of 80 hemispheres. And um, all of these individuals uh, were healthy individuals. They did not have lacunar infarcts. So as you can see, there's a very robust vascular supply coming from all these segments. It's amazing. It's impressive. You can see probably this is the short recurrent. You can see my uh, mouse. This is the recurrent artery of Hubner, And this is the short central artery, both going basal ganglia. Um, 
This second specimen tells you a totally different picture. You can see the blood supply here is not as nearly as robust. In fact, there's barely any blood supply, any, any perforators coming from the ACA, aside from the two dominant short, short their current artery and short central. And uh, in, in our study, 19 to 20% of specimens, these recurrent artery food nourish short, short central provided the main vascular supply to the basal ganglia region. So you can immediately see that between two different individuals, they have two very different patterns that the number, the caliber, and the distribution of these vessels is, is different. And then we went on after injecting these uh, specimens, we sliced them, uh, we preserved them in formalin, and then we sliced them to these very thin slices and examined them, them under the microscope. And as you can see in this cut, there is mainly the basal ganglia is mainly red. So the main supply is coming from the ACA, from its perforators, recurrent artery of Hubner and short central artery. There's a minor supply from the proximal M1 and the distal M1 here in blue and yellow on the left side, and even less uh, contribution on the right side. And then we, want, we went on to study a whole bunch of other brains. So if you look at the slide on the right lower um, corner here, you can see that the ACA is supplying the main portion of the basal ganglia on the right side. It has a much less significant contribution on the left side. And even the spatial distribution is different between left and right. So the blood supply is not only different between two patients, but it's also different between the two hemispheres of the same patient. The other slide, the other specimen tells a totally different story. This is mainly M1. So as you can imagine, a patient who has a stroke in that a ACA territory here would be devastated, but he would have maybe will, will get a silent infarct. And that probably explains why now we have up to 20 different lacunar syndromes described and why some up to 50% of these patients go on to have silent infarcts, whereas the other 50 to 80 patient percent are debilitated. Again, every, every two slides that I will show you, every, from these 80 uh, hemispheres will tell you a different story and will show you that the blood supply is extremely variable. So what can we do with this information? We know that the vascular supply is now variable and that this will have impact on patient presentation. What can we do about this? As you can see, this is a, a beautiful seven Tesla image showing you this lenticular striate vessel, but we don't know where it's coming from. We know it's an anticlus, right? We know it's probably coming from ACA or MCA and that it's coming to the basal ganglia region, as Prof. Osman always instructs me to say, basal ganglia region. But we don't know where in the basal ganglia it's going to, and we can't trace it. We can't do anything about it. So how, how, is, how is the 7 Tesla helping us? Well, undeniably, 7 Tesla can show marvelous amount of details. As you can see, we're going from 1.5 here to three Tesla that we have now at West that, that we use for um, uh, functional applications to seven Tesla that we have at Sinai, but we use for research purposes. It's amazing. You can even see the distribution of the nuclei here, the basal ganglia, but this is not common and this is not available. And the, this is true for um, um, everywhere across the country. And if you look at the vessels that's in seven Tesla, you can 1.5, you can barely see them. Three Tesla have some great details here. And then it's, it's a significant amount of information that we get, can gain. Well, again, this has not been um, employed or used in, in, in the case of lacunar infarcts. It's showing us these vessels, but we cannot um, truly use it or apply it to the treatment of these stroke and to help these patients. Well, how about NGO? Angiography can show uh, up to 1,000 microns. That's a millimeter. How about these 50 to 4,000 micron vessels? we still can't get there. We still can't access these vessels. And this is just a, a quick study, that, a case study that was published in uh, Surgical Neurology International of 45-year-old gentleman presenting with dizziness and visual field deficits that was found to have occipital liver infarct treated with aspirin. Six, six months later, the man presented with a loss of consciousness. MRI shows that the patient has no supply from the vertebral arteries, both were totally occluded. And you can see within geography, there is a trace vessel coming between anterior and posterior circulation. This could be the PCOM, but this could not, there's no way this man was getting his blood supply from only this vessel. Look at the seven Tesla. 
the seven Tesla is showing this corkscrew perforator bypass vessel going from anterior to posterior circulation. So the man uh, developed his own bypass, but we couldn't see this on NGO. So basically, that what what's what's this is a snapshot telling us that in 1838 we learned about the term lacunes from Prof. de Chambre in France. In, in 1901, the syndromes, the clinical syndromes of lacunar infarcts that we know now were described by Prof. Mary, and then Prof. Miller Fisher in 1960s defined these the lacunar hypotheses. And then the paper I showed you in 1979, the clinical and anatomical correlates of these lacunar infarcts. And then Brock Vasquez, 1998, the uh, short central artery. But since then, our progress has been very limited. What's happened since, since 1998? We have some anatomical studies telling us that there's the general uh, uh, view, the general understanding of the vascular supply of basal ganglia, but we don't know the distribution of these vessels and we can't see or treat them. We can't help these patients. Can we help or treat this man differently today? The answer is no. And just as a wise man always tells me, just because you don't see something doesn't mean it's not there. Just because we didn't see these these tracts years ago doesn't mean they didn't exist. And just because NASA didn't see these uh, thousands of galaxies before July 2022 doesn't mean they're not there. So in summary, the, the, the next part, obviously we don't have time for this, but we're happy to come at a later time and, and, and talk to you, Mir or, or Prof. Osman, on the diagnosis and management on lacunar strokes and the work that we've been doing. But basically what I've told you is that we have a major problem. We have 20% of patients having debilitating strokes and our understanding of these strokes has not significantly evolved since the 1998. We can't see these vessels, we can't treat them, and this, uh, uh, and an, an amazing amount of work is being done somewhere else. At the second part of the talk, we'll show you the progress that has been made in the therapeutics and the uh, molecular uh, therapies targeting these strokes. But as neurosurgeons, as interventionalists, we haven't really progressed much in terms of seeing and treating these vessels to help our patients. And I'll, I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zara, and I, I like the cliffhanger, so we'll have to have you come back and give us part two. <laughs> Any questions for Zara? I'll just say that both Zara and Santiago have excelled uh, on the service, and you know your presence here is felt very strongly, very keenly. You both are bringing a level of quality to the program that I'm sure that your all of your mentors would be very proud to see how you're doing. So thank you.